Hi everyone, this is Karim, Karim Baran with Solar Academy. I'm here today with uh, John Bonanno, my uh, partner in uh, crime in, at Solar Academy of Strategic Operating Partners. And today we are hosting Ali Detrio of Reimagine Power. Ali is an expert in energy policy in the US, mostly in California, but also beyond. And she has been uh, working on a number of uh, important initiatives uh, in in the space and Ali can you as we start can you give us a little bit a little bit of your personal background your uh, prof you know hi professional history and uh, and then let's get into this topic of uh, the current uh, proposed decision that is causing uh, some havoc in in California uh, markets yeah, no, thanks, Karim. Thanks, John, so much for having me. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining in and tuning in to us. Um, my name is Ali Dietrio. As Karim said, I'm the chief st strategist and founder of Reimagine Power. Uh, we're a boutique microgrid and distributed energy resources policy and market strategy consulting firm headquartered here in San Francisco, um, the clean tech capital of the world. Um, I actually originally got my bachelor's of science in sustainability. I was part of the first ever undergraduate class in the world to get an accredited degree in sustainability back in the day when almost no one knew what that was uh, from Arizona State University. Um, and I went into uh, the water and power sector uh, while I was in college because what do people need more than anything else in this world? Um, and so really, originally I found myself in water policy, groundwater management, water rights and contracts, Salt River Project. Um, and eventually they told me that they couldn't keep me as a newly grad, new grad after uh, without 10 years of experience and a master's degree in water policy. But they said, you should try the power sector. And so I did and moved over into renewables. Um, and from there, I've held a variety of positions in business development, market research, um, government regulatory affairs, um, and nonprofit management and membership. Um, and so I found myself in this career, long journey, uh, been in here now about seven, almost 17 years in the energy sector, um, moved to California in 2014. So I've been here about a decade now, and that led me into the world of advocacy, um, policy, intelligence, research, lobbying, and market strategy work. Previously, uh, I worked at NG, one of the largest energy services and clean energy developers in the world. And that's where I cut my teeth on uh, energy storage and microgrid policy um, and led me to the role I'm at today, where I really focus a lot on advanced clean energy technologies like microgrids, uh, sophisticated energy projects like multifamily solar and storage, and a variety of other initiatives. So it's been a fun ride. I'm glad to be here. Um, and as Kara mentioned, I am uh, one of the boots on the ground in the trenches in the various policy arenas here in California. I've been working in depth on the microgrid proceeding at the PUC, the Distributed Energy Backup Assets Program at the Energy Commission. And as we're uh, going to talk about today, um, the virtual net metering and net metering aggregation phase of the NEM proceeding at the CPUC, which is a hotly contested issue on the adoption of solar and transition to solar plus storage in California. So really happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Thanks, Ali. Um, yeah, so let's dive into uh, what's happening in solar in California. As we do that, I, you know, I just want to set, set the stage with uh, a couple of my comments, you know, having also been uh, operating mostly in California in solar over, for almost a decade and a half. When I look at California, I, I, I kind of see it as an irony of ironies in solar uh, is in California, mainly because California has been a major leader in solar in the world and in the U.S. It's um, when you look at the residential and uh, small commercial market and distributed solar market, it is clearly the the leader in the U.S. Uh, with, you know, probably half of all residential and small commercial solar uh, deployed in, in the state with 15 percent of uh, homes as individual homes having uh, solar uh, at this point, having gone through a a stage of uh, net energy metering 1.0, 2.0, and now 3.0, three versions of uh, net energy metering policies. Um, and so in many ways, it's a great state to benefit from solar. And 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 uh, like we said, 10, 15% of homes, mostly uh, well-to-do and richer homes have benefited uh, from these uh, policies. Yet what's going down right now 
uh, with this new uh, proposed decision, uh, especially when it comes to multifamily and aggregation type uh, solutions, um, what is on uh, what is being proposed is very much uh, stifling and blocking the part of the population that is, I would say, probably uh, economically the uh, bottom 40, 50 percent of the population, which is mostly renters and multifamily home dwellers, um, are not going to be able to benefit from the benefit uh, from from uh, the benefits of solar and their landlords as well. So I want to dive into that topic with you, Ali, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, how did we get here? Can you Said, you know, can you give us the the evolution? Roll of solar? it back to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Come yeah, on. exactly. Million, Let's go back million to the rooftops. million. So, uh, and this and, is a bipartisan issue. Everyone wants low cost, and you know what? And electrons. He said a million rooftops, and it did happen. And now we're probably getting close to two million. And yet, um, 40 45 percent of the population rents in multifamily settings, and they are not what this proposed decision is saying is. Uh, completely unreasonable. The no, they're I... being excluded. This entire population is being excluded intentionally. And that's yeah. what's so outrageous about this. Yeah. Agree 100%. I mean, how did we get here from, how did we get to where we are today? Um, I think John and Karen will lead to it well. You know, our original solar policies in California date back to the late 1990s with the establishment of the net energy metering program, the Million Solar Roofs Initiative at the California Energy Commission. And I would argue we're so very successful in not only deploying so much solar in California, but really spurring this energy market evolution and transformation um, of the energy sector that has spread broadly across the country and across the world. And we all know that as California goes, so does the rest of the U.S. and the world. So it's critically important for us to not only continue being a leader in solar energy policy, but recognize the impacts that our policymaker and regulatory decisions have impact the markets, not just our own home state here, but also reverberate broadly uh, well beyond our state borders. And so, you know, back in the early, like late 90s, early 2000s, the state established policies that were meant to encourage self-generation, on-site consumption of clean energy resources to help reduce demand on the grid, to help us start our climate policy goals and really accelerate decarbonization and energy independence. So again, both sides of the aisle, solar, microgrids, like clean energy resources that are deployed on-site locally is something that all political stripes can get on board with for various reasons. Really important to highlight the bipartisan support for these types of, of solutions. And so back in the 90s and 2000s, our state took a number of steps to incentivize property owners primarily to install solar, mostly by virtue of our legacy policy and regulatory instruments at the time um, that you know were not intended necessarily to exclude any particular customer class, but naturally uh, tended to enable one's customer class to benefit from solar, which was those that own property, primarily homeowners with the creation of net energy metering, where you could install solar on your home or on your property. You installed a bi-directional meter that could record the production of the solar and your meter would spin backwards. And when you exported that, or it would spin backwards when you exported power and it would spin forwards when you imported power. Pretty simplistic uh, energy and electric electricity technology. And so that allowed for many millions of customers to install solar. And that was something that was directed by our governor at the time, directed by the state legislature, encouraged by the regulators and our early adopter technology uh, you know, customers really took a lot of risk in deploying these new technologies and really helped get the market off the ground from its infancy into where we're at today. And so fast forward, you know, the last five, six years or so, the legislature has acknowledged that and the regulators have acknowledged that we've had, you know, a tremendous shift in market transformation where our adoption levels have increased tremendously. And so the simplistic net energy metering regulatory construct was no longer uh, meeting the needs of California, especially when it relates to our grid needs, where we now have a ton of solar on the yeah. grid. 
mostly from utility scale resources, by the way, the distributed customer side is still a small you know, fraction of the overall adoption levels. But nonetheless, so much unbuffered solar has caused us to have the duck curve and uh, challenges in the grid. And so now the, the, the state has taken steps to incentivize energy storage and make sure that we pair solar and storage together to help mitigate impacts on the grid and make sure that these resources can be more grid assets, not just unbuffered solar resources. And I was fortunate to work on SB 700 with Scott Wiener, passing $800 million of new S-chip incentive money for storage. And that money has been already almost con uh, completely used up because storage has been now become so popular with the adoption of solar. So we're really making a lot of progress in the market. However, again, going back to the who has really benefited, who has adopted solar thus far, it's largely been those that own property, homeowners, businesses, public entities, which is all great. And we should be thanking them for their contributions to decarbonization and grid modernization. But we cannot forget about this other large swath of the market, the renting population, which is 45% of the state's population rents. And overwhelmingly, the renting community is largely populations of vulnerable communities, communities of color, low income, disadvantaged or otherwise vulnerable. Um, and are statistically likely to rent. And so we have this large swath of the market that has not yet really accessed the benefits of solar until the last few years when the split incentive problem of property owners of multifamily and multi-unit buildings figuring out a way to build solar on their properties and monetize the resource while also sharing some of the financial savings with their tenants to create a win-win value proposition and so that has happened primarily through the virtual net metering uh, tariff that is meant to encourage uh, solar adoption at multi-unit buildings. And while it was a rough start, uh, I think that over the last couple of years, we've seen a tremendous increase in adoption, even just the last three years, going from about 30 megawatts of adoption to nearly 100. And now as we're looking at these rules potentially changing, which we'll get into soon with Karim and John, now there's many more multifamily buildings installing solar and helping these renting communities that have historically lacked access. So it's really a success story all around. And it's unfortunate that we're dealing with so many challenges in the regulatory arena now um, that may be hindering this progress um, and why it's so important for us to change course and make sure we continue this forward progress and momentum in the market. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Ali. So, um, yeah, let's dive into what's happening on the VNAM side, which really affects the multifamily uh, market uh, directly. Why Why is this, you know, I mean, having lived in California and having uh, put solar on my home before, so I, I do know that, you know, as a, as a residential homeowner, you know, I I benefited greatly economically from putting solar with a four year payback. You know, and then uh, you know I was part of the NEM 1.0 um, cohort, if you will. So essentially, for you know, cost me four years of electricity, but thereafter, I pretty much 95 plus percent of my bill was uh, 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 zeroed out. So I, you know, uh, I get. 20 plus years of free energy there thereafter. Um, so in the case of Vena and multifamily, um, we there are solutions in the market, one of which uh, we're familiar with, uh, Ivy, as uh, your client and a company that John and I are invested in and um, invested in and uh, associated with. Um, they, they have a, you know, when I first met Ivy, I, and my first reaction was, what a beautiful solution. It's essentially a win-win-win solution for uh, the landlords, the tenants, uh, the developers, the EPC companies, even the grid, if you think about it with a certain perspective, because it essentially helps the grid be more resilient, uh, less capital intensive, and uh, and still do do the main function uh, with much less capital uh, and that capital not being deployed by them, but, you know, others at the edge of the grid. So um, can you tell us a little bit about this world and why what is being proposed right now is unfair? And and, and let's also talk about other players and how, how it affects, um, you know, everyone else in, in this uh, sector as well. Yeah, happy to. So um, 
right now, again, like virtual net metering has been helping many multifamily buildings uh, and renters install solar and have a way to monetize the resource so they can pay back the asset that was invested in originally, as well as provide a means of sharing some of the financial benefits with tenants that they get discounts on their electric bills. One thing that's really unique about any sort of multi-meter arrangement um, when you're installing solar on a property is that unlike the house where I talk about the single meter recording production and consumption through one venue and really your connection to the grid, there's a single service delivery point or point of interconnection to the home, it's easy to monitor the flow of power in and out. So in multimeter arrangements, there are there's a production meter that measures production of the solar energy system on site, and there are uh, consumption meters measuring individual electricity consumption by each of the tenants, and the meters are separate. So now the electricity flows are governed by the laws of physics and Kirchhoff's current law, where electricity will flow to wherever there's least resistance, meaning it will flow to serve the on-site customer load of each of those individual meters and any excess electricity produced beyond what is required by all those customers at a given time interval will be exported beyond the property to the grid. And so a element of measuring on-site consumption of the generation asset is this concept of netting, which essentially nets production and consumption in a given interval since those meters are separate. In a single meter arrangement, you don't need that mechanism to measure self-consumption because you have one bi-directional meter. Right. So, so if you're producing with solar, you're also cons and, and you're consuming at the same time, you're essentially producing that, I mean, uh, provided that you've paid for the solar panels already, that's free energy for you at that point. You're not pulling that from the grid in a single family home environment. So because your net is, uh, assuming is your netting is uh, zero for that split second. Uh, but in the case of multifamily, that's different. The netting mechanism is required to ensure that in a given time interval, you can measure or net production against consumption because the meters are separate in a multimeter. Right. This is no. really important. I'll come back to the, like why this is so important in the proposed decision. Um, but essentially, on-site customer load and the generating asset of a multifamily building is serving the needs of those customers when they have load and when there is generation being produced at the same time. Unfortunately, our uh, utilities have tried to uh, lie and misrepresent the physics uh, of electricity uh, and how electrical engineering principles work in a multimeter arrangement like a multifamily building at the CPUC. And so this has become a very contentious issue where they would like to measure all of the output from a shared solar asset at a multifamily building as if it is all exported to the grid. And therefore, you would only get um, valued for your solar exports at basically a wholesale rate. Which is like <laughs> one fifth of retail rate. I mean, one is probably valued at 25 to 40 cents, which is what the richest 15% of homeowners that already have solar are benefiting from currently. And this multifamily building owner is forced to sell it at the wholesale rate which averages around three to eight cents for 90% of the time, maybe averaging around five, six cents, if my understanding is correct. Can you? Yes, can you, exactly. You with that? So, yeah. Essentially with, with this construct, not only would you get a, a really bad financial deal where all of your exports are valued at this super low yeah, rate. Like five times worse than uh, the others pretty much. Yeah. But you're, it's also not physically correct where meters are just measurements at a certain point um, of electron consumption. Right. Now, like the physics say that, you know, again, multifamily buildings are generating, consuming that electricity on site, which helps them offset the amount of electricity that they would need to import from the utility at a retail rate. So, and multifamily buildings, by virtue of having so many customers under one roof and under one service delivery point, they're able to serve the on-site customer load of many different uh, many different tenants before anything is exported to the grid. So it's a really powerful demand management solution, even without storage. So even right. the solar 
generated on site because it has so many more avenues of individual tenant customers where it could serve their needs before it's exported. It reduces demand on the grid in a much more significant manner than a homeowner that installs solar where it has a one-to-one -one generator customer relationship. So it's yeah. a really powerful tool. And without that netting construct that I mentioned earlier, if you're forced to export or, or treat and account for all of your exports as exported when you were really consuming them on site, that retail value, as you mentioned, of self-consumption would be valued at 25, 40 cents, 60 cents, whatever the service territory is. But instead, you are being forced to account for it as exported at four to six cents, which is a horrible financial deal. And it also could constitute a taking of private properties. So there's some really right. bad issues with, with just that construct of accounting and what that actually means in practice for the building owners and the renters when we're talking about accounting. The second yeah, when I look, oh, if I may say one thing, if when I look at this problem with like first principles approach, my mind immediately goes to okay, screw them. Let's just let's just put our own solar and batteries in these buildings, and we'll still be better off. Just like in Hawaii, the economics works better for uh, you know many property owners to cut themselves off from the grid and just put solar and batteries on their property. I mean, with the current trends of cost coming down rapidly that's going to be the reality in california very quickly so but there's also a limitation to uh selling energy like a property owner i don't think is allowed to legally sell energy to their tenants in california you can resell you can there you are allowed to um you are allowed to provide electricity service to your tenants under public utilities code section 218 um, an owner that has an electric asset that is generated on site for their own use or the use of their tenants, that's all legal. Okay. Um, so allowed to provide service. And there's other sections of the public utilities code where uh, an, ass an owner that installs an asset is allowed to charge for the electricity service so long as it doesn't exceed the rate of the PPA that they have with like the solar own the solar asset developer yep. or the, the um, electric utility, whichever is lower. Okay. And Main reason the main thing is that under master metering laws and consumer protection laws that are pretty widespread, not just in California, you're not allowed to mark up utility provided power. However, apartment owners are legally allowed to provide their own electric service to their tenants. And so the one thing that the PD really, I think, misconstrues is portions of the law stating that that's not legal when it absolutely is. It's a very plain reading of, of different public utilities code sections. Um, and so I do think that absent a workable v tariff that's adopted as the successor in this proceeding, we will start to see apartment owners just yeah. not engage and either, you know, disconnect completely or install solar assets that do seller and storage assets that do not contribute to our grid needs, which is a horrible unintended outcome and consequence that we don't want and will only exacerbate equities in the energy system, inequities in the system long term. We don't want def grid defection to happen. Regulators should be thinking about and worried about, rightly, customers leaving the grid and defecting. And they should be thinking about how do we incentivize customers to stay connected to the grid when we have, you know, utilities right. who've been providing subpar service and our grid is antiquated and we're not even able to get interconnection for years sometimes right. and figuring out how we can stay connected, incentivize them to stay connected and contribute to the system and meeting our decarb and moder grid modernization goals. Yeah. So yeah. this piece is really going backwards and not really thinking through all of these consequences um, as well, well as ignoring completely the disparate impacts that this decision would have on these underserved renting communities who are again, overwhelmingly likely to be low income or minority populations. And so there could be potential equal rights protections violations at stake here as well. In addition to a number of other state laws that this PD appears to just simply ignore. So there's a lot at stake here when it comes to our grid modernization goals, empowering energy independence, ensuring renters have fair access to clean energy and receive the same level of benefits that homeowners do. And so there's there's really a lot here that needs to be changed in order for us to have a tariff that complies with the laws 
and helps us move forward with all of our various aggressive goals here in California. Allie, you're, you're, you're like such a fountain of wisdom. And I, because you're such a smart person, I'd like to ask you to steel man the opposing argument to this, which the IOUs have clearly made to the CPUC and have somehow convinced them to write this nonsense in, which basically protects their incumbency and really hurts the 45% of the population that rents and is being completely excluded by the NEM V3 uh, um, uh, legislature that's being proposed. So steel man their side, and then you can debunk that to conclude. Yeah, um, I think one of the biggest things that they argued is saying that, you know, these resources are not providing any sort of benefits to the grid, um, that these are just more, again, unbuffered solar resources, and that property owners are the only ones that are really benefiting. So they really tried to discredit the notion that we're providing benefits to renters and that we're providing benefits to the grid by reducing demand. Okay. Is is this because there has been no evidence of a virtual meter working at scale? Like maybe the um, solutions no. weren't there or are there solutions that have been demonstrated at scale and they're just sort of ignoring that fact? Um, the utilities are doing everything in their power to lie, misrepresent. Well, hang on, hang on. I'm still, I'm asking you to steel man their position. So I'm just asking oh. from their perspective, are they just not aware that things like IV energy exist that can do the split of load versus generation and usage um, accurately on a bill? Or are they just saying, yeah, yeah, we're aware of that, but let's forget about that for a second. Like, one, argu one argument that I read in their documents says that it's too complicated. It's two bills uh, oh, presented yeah. to the tenants as opposed to one bill. But hey, if the bill is saving you 20 bucks, hey, what's an extra minute to pay another bill uh, You know, every month? Because the the tenants well, why don't are we, saving. Why don't we consolidate those bills then? Why don't we make VNAM? Well, well, well probably at that bills, point, private companies can start selling, sending bills. Yeah, with and, and resource on it. Yes, and one argument to, to that could be that oh, we don't want to give up the customer service function to a last mile operator like Ivy. But if the last mile operator like Ivy and you know there are others, other competitors of Ivy like King Energy that does it in the commercial setting and a number of others, um, you know. When these last mile microgrid operators take over the function of billing, um, that might not feel um, so good to a so utility why can't they that has been in that business for hundred years. For hundred years. Okay, um, steel so man. They're... Back to the steel man alley. Do it. Do it. They're saying two bills are too complicated for the end user. Bah, baloney. <laughs> It's baloney. This all comes down to exactly what Karim said. Utilities don't want to give up any sort of power or hold with their customers. They do not like the idea of, they've actually implemented laws that require direct metering because they want to make sure that they keep control and connection to the customers. They can bill all of the customers, all the non-bypassable charges and fees separately. And that they want to make sure that these solutions that help deploy more solar wherever it is, and especially the multifamily building, do not rise to the level of adoption that homeowners have because it's a serious threat to their current and future revenue as well as their current and future profits. Utilities make money based on infrastructure, transmission and distribution infrastructure. They get a 10 to 12% rate of return on that. So by reducing demand on the system from these properties with installed solar and storage, and even again, like consolidating customer accounts into one like one billing function that for them is a huge threat to their current and future business model and that is the main reason we are here today dealing with this they have then well, attempted that's to let's unpack that for a second Allie, because the way a utility like southern edison or pg e the way they make money is they, they create these enormous capital expenditure projects, whether it's a big generation facility or more transmission and distribution lines. And they then get the permission from the California Public Utility Commission, which their job is to protect the, the energy user yep. of the state of California. That's their job. That's their claim job. And they want to protect that relationship because that's their revenue. But we're basically, as energy users, we've paid for that infrastructure. So don't we own that, not them? You don't the energy it. users of California own that infrastructure and not them? 
that's the way it should be. And especially in like, you look at a multifamily building with this new real estate developments, not only that, but the developers are the ones that build and the infrastructure, the delivery infrastructure that serves these properties. And then they are forced to deed it over to the utilities at a rate that includes the cost and the aid of construction. So ongoing, like, um, uh, percentages hmm. of the fees, they build it, they pay for it, and then they are forced to deed it over to the utilities who then operate it and again get their guaranteed rate of return over the long term. Yeah. Uh, we we rate payers have paid for the grid many, many times over. There's a big notion in this proceeding and others about this notion of paying your fair share of grid costs, that they've successfully uh, poisoned the well, both in the CPUC and the legislature, and trying to assert that solar customers are not paying their fair share of grid costs, even though we absolutely have. And many of our costs have been, are continue to be paid through non-bypassable charges where solar can't even offset those costs. They don't wanna give an inch that is the bottom line. There's a big enough pie for everyone to go around. Like Even if we deployed all of these last mile solutions at every multifamily building, it would actually make the utilities jobs easier. They would lose hardly any revenue and profit, but this would allow for a lot more market innovation and help reduce demand on the system, which again, the core issue is that when you reduce demand on the system, it reduces the need for more infrastructure build out, like you said, these capital intensive assets. And for them, they're looking at the long game of when there's less T&D need, then there is less profit for them. So there, I'll come mi back yeah, there might be less D, but there's always going to be a need for T because we, we see, I think the, the ideal solution is a hybrid solution where you never get rid of the, the, the grid and you always have some backup uh, source tied to the grid and therefore a, a need for the major transmission lines. But probably shifting most of that um, origin, you know, production and last mile uh, consumption to micro, you know, microgrid environments as many of them as possible is probably the ideal solution. So the, so the the solution is really the behind the transformer, not the behind the meter. Like, let's move this right. idea of where you're point ends and where it begins out to the local transformer of the building, that's that's potentially a solution here, is it not, Ali? Oh, absolutely. Behind the transformer, anything on the same feeder that never, and by the way, VNM systems, it says 98% of them are all on the same feeder. So they're never even make all the power that's generated locally is never even making it behind one feeder and one, you know, major circuit. Wait, how in, how much of a percentage? 98? 98%. Holy crap. So basically, if we just said, let's make the transformer the quote unquote meter, this would solve this problem completely, would it not? Absolutely. And again, at to Karim's point, this is a both and conversation. We need both like we need, we need both centralized grid solutions like our T and D infrastructure, especially to wheel power between cities. And we can't have every single um, you know demand of electricity met with uh, local generation. There will be some that's needed from the bulk power system. But the more and more we can deploy locally the more cost effective it is and the more resilient and reliable it is for customers as well as again there's enough there's enough market share and enough pie to go around our utilities unfortunately they don't want to share all, any of it and that's by virtue of them being you know entitled 100 year old monopolies and the CPUC liking the devil they know their charter, as they call it, is to protect the public interest, so to speak, but it's really to regulate these electrical corporations, and therefore, they don't want to open the market and empower a lot of new providers and solutions. They want to just regulate the devil they know. And unfortunately, in the 20th century, that worked when we had the one-way flows of power and we needed a lot of, you know, big centralized generating stations to, you know, get power to every customer when we didn't have electricity. But those 20th century goals have been met. We have new 21st century goals like decarbonization, like environmental justice, like resilience and high rely highly reliable power. We need to be focused on these 21st century solutions, and therefore the regulatory model needs to adapt to the 21st century, but we are still operating very much in a 20th century paradigm 
Um, and that is one of the biggest problems. So it is very much a both and. There's enough here for everyone to play and everyone to win um, and everyone to deploy these solutions, again, with maximum value to customers and rate payers at an affordable cost. Um, but we have uh, entrenched interests that do not want to step aside and give up even one meter. Ali, well said. Thank you very much for shedding light to this uh, really complicated situation. So given what's going down in the process of this proposed decision, what 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 do we need to do? What, what do uh, citizens need to do? What is some call to action that we can end this call with? I think the biggest thing is for anyone, you know, whoever you are getting engaged in um, letting your legislature, legislators know, your the CPUC know by submitting a public comment to their docket card or calling the governor at 916-445-2841 and make your voice heard. Any of these channels, it only takes 30 seconds to a minute to let the state of California and the policymakers and regulators know that this proposed decision would eviscerate the value proposition of solar for multifamily buildings, renters, as well as schools, farms, and small businesses. Anyone that's a renter in this state, which is again, 45% of our state's population. If you're a renter, engage your state representatives, the PUC or the governor, and let them know that this proposed decision needs to be rescinded and an alternate issued that prioritizes the needs of renters, expanding access to solar, and making sure that everyone gets a fair deal and fair access to clean energy in this 21st century. Yeah, Karen, let's have those links below in the show yeah. notes so that people can cool. call that governor's office or make that a submission digitally. This sounds like such it's such a crazy thing that yeah. this is happening. Let's get it solved. Thank you. Well, Ali, thank you for uh, for speaking uh, truth to power in in this session. As uh, somebody needs to do that. And thank you, Ali. This was fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Aram. Thanks, John. It was great having this discussion with you guys. Uh, look forward to more in the future. And thanks everybody for tuning in today. We will. Thank you. Thank you.